<laughs> Today we're going to have um, three presentations around uh, stepwise, which is this method that uh, Larry and Dimitri are going to talk to us about, which um, is a kind of uh, action research method for young people, for students, um, uh, based in the critical science classroom. classroom. And I think Larry developed this method and is going to talk to us about this. And Dimitri mm -hmm. is a science teacher who's um, applying this method in his classroom. And then I'm actually going to share a couple of um, reflections at the end because I was lucky enough to do um, a case study in Dimitri's classroom where I observed or participated in a stepwise um, program. And I'm going to reflect more specifically on how we can, um, well, what happens when we try and implement critical pedagogies in the secondary school classroom and what are the issues we bump into and what are the opportunities. So yeah, Larry, if you want, I'll pass over to mm -hmm. you. Um, I'm leaving the presentation of how you want to present yourself well, up to you. That's good. Right. <laughs> Okay, I hope the technology works here. So is that screen showing? Yeah, and just to tell you, Larry and Dimitris, I will just tell you when 10 minutes have passed, yeah? Oh, good, yeah, I was gonna That's set a timer okay. here, actually. Okay, <clears throat> so yeah, um, I'd like to talk to you about critical and activist science and technology education. Actually, <clears throat> I've given it in different names over the years. The as, I, as you've been told, the underlying project is called step, uh, Stepwise. Um, I'll uh, elaborate a little bit later as I go. So um, I wanted to be upfront with my position. I'm a retired professor, but still very active with research and publication. And um, this is basically very simplistic, but nevertheless, um, there's an image to uh, give you some uh, ideas around where I stand politically uh, and economically and socially uh, around science and technology education. <clears throat> so I think that elite, so-called 1% um, of the population are using STEM professionals and STEM educators and large fractions of populations to serve as cheap labor, sucking up resources and uh, creating all kinds of problems as they create uh, ongoing um, products and services uh, <clears throat> with an agenda to continuously grow, uh, regardless of uh, the damage that is happening surrounding them. So I kind of assume that <clears throat> what I've just said is not particularly startling to, to many people in this group from what I could gather. So let me know as we go along. <clears throat> but so because of these problems that I see, um, we have been, since 2006, promoting uh, so-called RENA projects, that is short for research-informed and negotiated uh, actions um, to address harms that the students perceive in relationships amongst science, technology, or STEM, <clears throat> and society, members of societies and environments. In, in Ontario, where I work for many years, we've had a STSE uh, component of the curriculum um, that now a conservative government is, is trying to wipe out. Um, so there's lots of politics involved in this. But um, these RENA projects essentially uh, involve the students generating a series of actions, a collection of act actions that uh, may support common values values common to those students. Uh, they can base their, their actions though on their, we've encouraged them to uh, carry out primary research, uh, of course, secondary research like internet searches. And we've, uh, we've certainly uh, kept in mind that students prior education will combine with these more uh, firsthand knowledge sources uh, to inform their decisions about actions to take. So that's that's the RENA project that we aim to promote and have since 2006. Before I can proceed with, well, how do we get the, the students to the point where they can do that? 
<clears throat> um, I want to have you ask yourself, what do you see here? Um, maybe we could entertain a couple of quick answers. What, do, what does anyone see? Anyone at all? Jesus. Okay, anyone else? House. House, okay. One more? A map. A map, yes. That's, so yeah. these are very common um, conceptions or views that people have of a common object. So it's, you know, obviously, or at least we think it's obvious that it's black and white images, uh, less and more light. Uh, but uh, that stim those stimuli, of course, create cause us to construct in our minds uh, particular perspectives that are unique to us and actually very resistant to change. So whatever ideas we have in our heads already, um, it's not easy to change them. Now, quickly, when I do this with students, I typically kind of lead them to see, oh, yes, there's a bearded man here. Not everyone will see that, but that in itself is a pedagogical point in the sense that students' conceptions of uh, any kind of image or information varies, and it depends on their uh, existing uh, con constructs in their minds, um, and they're different. They may or may not be correct and so on. So there are all kinds of pedagogical impl implications of uh, this kind of phenomena is support for constructivist-based teaching and learning. Not to say that they're the same, by the way, but uh, I guess I'm waiting for questions down the road. <clears throat> Next slide. There. Um, so to get the students to the point where they can indeed conduct RENA projects independent of authority figures, and for many years, I was a promoter of intellectual independence, and I continue to be to some extent. Now, uh, so given uh, the differences that you see, actually, I, I think I forgot something, but anyway, uh, given the differences that you see in students' abilities to discover things, we, we uh, provide them with a pedagogy that is basically this three cycle sets of lessons and activities you can learn much more about them at the stepwiser.ca site, but broadly speaking, particularly important aspect of this is direct instruction with application activities. Now that may or may not jive with you in terms of very common inquiry-based learning approaches. I don't know if that's something that is, is sort of prioritized in, the, in, uh, in Europe. Um, it's, it's certainly a big thing in the States and to some extent here in Canada. Um, so in opposition to expecting students to discover those uh, things that we think are important to them and, and are denied of their access through to propaganda that goes on in the world, and I could go on and on, uh, we, we strongly believe in direct teaching with application activities. So it's not in one ear and out the other. It's them learning something and using it uh, in that teacher teaches phase. And then we get them to practice these projects with support from the teacher, not guidance. So it's it's not, these are not guided inquiries. These are an action projects. These are uh, student led with teacher support type activities. And then we get them to think, well, where am I now? We get them to reflect on their current positions. And then they may, the teacher may decide, okay, you've had enough of this, you're ready for that. So that's the stepwise pedagogy, as probably as short as I can make it. Um, and uh, <clears throat> uh, I am going to elaborate a little bit on uh, RENA projects. So here's another way of looking at RENA projects. It's particularly important uh, in the sense that uh, through their research, uh, which some people say is just science, but anyway, translations between phenomena of the world and their representations, um, <clears throat> we've been encouraging actor network theory use. So having the students generate actor network maps based on their secondary research and their own reflections. And then there's some primary research 
In this case, we've encouraged students to not only try to tell people what actions are, they take, not only should we have them tell people things that they might do, but actually create a, a new, uh, hopefully eco-just technology that can become part of a, a, a normalized world, a change normalized world. Um, now, how's my time? Who's very, very fine. Okay, I'm going to play. I'd like to play this video. I think it's a nice example of the what students have been doing in this kind of work. But what what is it that you're actually right, working on right now? I'm blocking out the different networks in my mind map. You're, you're what? I'm blocking out the different networks in my mind map. Oh, you're blocking out the different networks in your mind map. Okay, so. Uh, what have you blocked out so far? And why I see you have something in yellow color there. Can yeah. you just tell uh, me briefly what those are? The yellow colors are basically representing all of the workers and like their problems, like problems with global warming and things like floods and the effects of global warming. And then going into like UNICEF and like child labor. And then what is the product that you're that you're that you're studying? Uh, panting shampoos. Panting shampoos. Okay. And what's the purple ones that I see there? The purple ones are all of the people who make money off of the product. So the company, the like the farmers who get the sugar cane, which was then made into plastic. Um. So all along the way, people, somebody there is profiting, right? Would those people line up together and to support a, to support this brand image of the shampoo? Or yeah, because if there is less people buying the product, there, there, um, yeah, like th that affects how much money. Yeah. They that have. affects my, how much money they might it's have. Not their quality okay. of life. Thank you. Didn't blow it. <laughs> There we go. So that's actually all I had to say. I hope I didn't go too far under or over. Um, if you're interested in learning more about it, I'm happy to have emails from you. Um, you can check out my actual website, but uh, part of that is the stepwise website component of it. The uh, address for that is a little different, stepwiser.ca. And um, one thing you might be interested in looking at is um, the journal that we have developed and, and run since 2009. It's an open access, um, non-refereed uh, journal called Journal for Activist Science and Technology Education. And uh, there's a short uh, link there that should take you to the site. And then finally, I have prepared a larger article for teachers that if you're interested, you can download from that tiny URL. So thanks. Thank you so much, Larry. Okay. Yeah, great. Thanks a lot. Um, there's so much in there, right? So like the whole yeah, yeah. mixture, trying to, and depending also where you're thinking from, no, the uh, like yes, yes. science, technology as environmental education, thinking that those like like the, the politics of science education with which we started with your nice slide. Yeah, and I'm really yeah. happy that you shared a, a little bit of footage in the end of some classroom because we were saying last time it would be so nice to actually see some of this in action. So yeah. we thought, um, we thought that we hear also from Dimitri and then we have a conversation all together. But if anyone has any like specific questions that is on their mind right now, you can put that in the um in the chat. And yeah, we'll share all these links. We'll 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 share the links in the email with everybody. So if you have some specific questions and you don't want to forget them, put them in the chat and then we'll do all the questions in the end. That's good with everybody. Right. Yeah. Um, so having finished in the classroom with Larry's presentation, we're now moving over into the classroom with Dimitri, who's a science teacher who's actually applied um, some of these methods. Okay. Hello, everyone. 
I'm sharing my screen now. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, my name is Dimitris. I'm a science teacher working in an independent uh, British school in Athens. I teach science, biology, and chemistry. And I will talk to you about the project work that I've been doing uh, in the schools that I've been working in the UK and in Greece. So if you're a teacher or an educator that has spent time or regularly work in schools, you might find that some of my interests might be similar to yours. I've always been interested in something more than mainstream education. I have a background in environmental education and have always been interested in uh, critical education as a way to empower individuals and groups. But of course, when it comes to apply something like this in real life, particularly in schools, it can be difficult and often disappointing. And it's like a game of chess in which you might be in a difficult position and you might feel always that you're a few moves behind. But I think that if you have a strategy and a framework like stepwise in mind, you can adapt to circumstances more easily and you, can, and you can claim some space to promote your perspective in a gradual step-by-step -step process. This uh, gradual step-by-step -step process will involve building alliances with colleagues, uh, head teachers, parents, pupils. Uh, the challenges in doing so are many. I'm not going to get into the details of this here, but if you're interested, we can talk more about this in the breakout rooms and of course in any questions that you might have. Uh, Lana has already presented the stages of stepwise. Students reflect, teacher teaches, students practice. And you can read a lot about this in uh, this book, uh, which uh, I think Larry has already shared the link, uh, but I will also share this one if it's not the same one, and which contains lots of activities, and I'm going to show you some of them now. So, Let's have a look at some examples. For the reflection stage, it's all about getting students to think what they already know, to discuss, exchange ideas. And this can be done by using different resources in different ways. It might be something in the news that relates to a local or global socio-scientific issue, a photograph, a painting, a video, an advertisement. Here you can see an activity. Uh, let me see if it look, I hope it looks clear. Uh, asking students to write down the first things that come to their minds relating to a controversial issue, such as fast food. They can add a positive or a negative experience that they have. This can be the start of exchanging ideas, and it's always interesting for them to hear each other views, but also to begin to realize that uh, this topic that they're choosing is not something in books only, but links to everyday life. Another one can be found here, uh, using advertisements, generally easy to find on the internet. Uh, you can ask questions to reflect on what does this picture show? What is the aim of an advertisement? What might be hidden? What message might be hidden behind an advertisement? Of course, the skill to reveal hidden messages of advertisements, for example, stereotypes, is something that students are going to develop step by step. The stimuli, though, that advertisements offer can be used through many strategies. One of them can be the silent conversation. This means that you can print uh, the images of the advertisements on a piece of paper, write down the questions, and circulate the posters around the class so students can write the responses in groups. Another one is the Four Corners, an activity I often use, and it is easy to set up. You place a controversial statement on the board, like the one I'm showing you here on the screen about lithium batteries, and ask students to consider whether they strongly agree, partly agree, somewhat agree, or completely disagree. Then they move around the class in different positions, exchange their reflections, carry out a debate and continue to move positions as they notice that their initial reflections can also change through arguments and discussions. Then we go to the next phase, the teacher teaches phase. Here we have to consider how students can develop research skills and action attitudes. For example, to learn from articles, from books, also to carry out their own experiments or 
questionnaires to answer their own research questions. You can use different sources for this purpose. For example, a video. I have added a video here with information about lithium mining and a, a struggle against one of them in Serbia. I chose this particular video because I had a student from Serbia in class. So I thought it might be a good idea also to get an example from the Balkans, which relates to the Greek context. Something like that can be supplemented with a set of questions through which students start to collect answers and they start to learn how to extract information. A very, of course, common idea about doing secondary research is analyzing articles. Through an activity such as the one I'm showing you here, the five W's and how, which I have adapted using the illustration of a petal of a flower. The flower is the issue and the things to learn about are the petals. They learn to break down information, who is involved, how, why, and so on. Through this process, the students start to come up with questions, which they can then answer doing their own research. I'm showing you here an example, a, a question that one of my year eight groups came up with. Uh, when they finished their secondary research on smoking, they realized that all those cigarette advertisements are not allowed on television. Tobacco companies actually pay influencers to advertise their products via social media. Then they came up with a research question. How aware are year eight and year nine students about this way of advertisements? They prepared the questionnaire and collect responses from peers. Then they analyzed the information and came up with a conclusion. And after this phase, we go to the practice phase. Uh, they choose a topic of their own choice. This is a critical stage because it has to be something they're passionate about. They have to be given options. Then, with partial teacher support or completely independently, if they're ready, they create a research-informed action, passing from the stages of secondary research and primary research. An example of that can, uh, can be seen here. In the context of planning this process, the teacher would recommend to students a set of activities to conduct the secondary research. For example, provide laptops access to the internet using an activity such as the five W's and how. Then the students would choose how they want to conduct their primary research. For example, doing an experiment or an interview or a questionnaire. And finally, they create an action that will reflect the learning process with a focus of their own. For example, raising awareness, boycott offenders, whatever they have decided to do. I'm showing you here, uh, and I'm finishing in just a few minutes, an example. These students chose to research plastic water bottles as part of a topic of uh, on water and synthetic polymers. They did the secondary research about plastic water bottles and where they end up. Then they analyze different uh, water samples from tap water and bottled water and use this information to organize a class event or a poster to share their ideas with the school community. I'm showing you here very briefly a few examples uh, of my uh, work. Uh, and this is because when students organize their action, it's actually where the fun part begins because they start to express themselves working on the road and they make different materials, for example, YouTube videos. They can make a leaflet, which can also be uploaded on the internet. They can make, for example, you can see here, the leaflet that students made about uh, tobacco. Uh, they can make a petition, which can also be supplemented with an article. Uh, I'm showing you here a petition made in relation to energy drinks by one of my year nines. Or they can also use different other ways, like, for example, I'm showing you a particular uh, action that I'm very proud about, a painting uh, one of my students made, uh, to share a critical view on genetic engineering and CRISPR technology. Finally, uh, something that uh, teachers can do to promote a culture of activism in class, in, in a more school level is to organize a presentation event where other students from other classes can visit. And there is a presentation of resources, teachers 
and students can move around the class asking questions and that can kind of create a, a nice uh, atmosphere, let's say. That was what I had to say. I hope you found it useful. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitri. Um, cool. Thank you so much. Um, it's really um, it's really interesting to see um, this. Like first, Larry talk about the wider, and I haven't heard Larry talk before, and uh, about the wider concept where this is coming from, and then really going into a classroom. Before we open up for questions, I wanted to share um, just some reflections because I was lucky enough to actually be part of um, of one of the early times that Dimitri uh, tried out stepwise in his classroom. And that was part of my uh, PhD study. And I was thinking about like, I, I in, in my study, I was thinking about critical pedagogies more generally and how to bring critical pedagogies into the secondary school classroom. And, and during this work, um, and now it really came through, um, you're actually teaching critical thinking. So it's a, a really political pedagogical project. And then what I've been learning from you um, and throughout this process is the specific focus, what does critical thinking in science education actually mean? mean and so that's where we where we got where we can come back to later i'm going to share a couple of things too um where am i so yeah so and maybe that that's gonna help us to round up. So my sense was, and I think Dimitri spoke about this in the beginning, and I think one of the questions that I saw already popping up for Larry maybe also links to that. So um, my sense working, like working, participating in Dimitri's classroom, what, like one of the really strong sensations that came across was this idea of carving out space for this kind of work in a secondary school. And that's specifically secondary school in the English context, which uh, having lived in other countries as well, I think is the neoliberal mindset is particularly strong there. But um, this like visceral thing of having to carve out space for this kind of work, um, like the, the, the difficulty of it and really like physically trying to make space for this kind of learning, which is just so brilliant and so deep. So um, observing him or participating in this kind of carving out process, um, I was thinking about how does then this kind of pedagogy, where does it clash with the dominant kind of um, education paradigm that the school sits in? And so, maybe that's also helpful for us when we're thinking how do we how can we bring this eco-social education into the into the classrooms well as a teacher you can bring it in but but more wider more more structurally you know so maybe these these three reflections are useful for us so um the the three kind of um clearer thoughts which came out and i'm sure that there are many more were one to do with assessment, one to do with time, and one to do with participation. So three areas um, that this kind of pedagogy really engages with in a very different way than the usual kind of um, education or classroom or school paradigm uh, uh, here. So really just some brief um, reflections there. So I love the final poster conference that uh, Dimitri just showed as well, which um, for me served as a sort of assessment because the students were working towards it. It was the end of the project. Um, and the assessment then was a kind of community embedded valorization of the learning 
and that's quite typical for a critical pedagogies project. So really um, teaching the others, their peers, their school community, the learning community, what they have learned throughout this project. And in this moment, the students were running the classrooms and I could see, you know, like um, students uh, discussing with each other about their projects or be, uh, going behind one of the posters and discussing it. So it's like these kind of small spaces of exchange of really thinking together. Um, for me, it was a really beautiful way of assessment. At the same time, the school put this, well, the year that I joined, put this whole project at the end of the year as an end of year project, which is already after the official assessment is over. So the time that the, well, and I'm going to come to time later, but the kind of assessment space that the school gives, gave this was after, it was not relevant for assessment. So while the students were learning a lot and sharing a lot, it was outside the assessment structure of the school. Um, there was an interesting moment where uh, the assistant head, I think, was at this poster um, conference and um, went up to one of the students and said, oh, I really love how you've been doing this. I would like to invite you to present your research on the school assembly, which is this kind of really important moment for a school. And the student was visibly really um, flattered by this and was really keen on showing that. So that kind of assembly moment in terms of assessment, in terms of learning is a completely different learning space than the, than the, um, than the poster conference. But it was also um, a moment where the, the, the student felt valorized by the education values, by the school values, and that filled him with pride. So there's this thing of wanting to create um, assessment spaces which are, um, well, outside the, the exam kind of pressure, but also acknowledging that students actually do want to, um, want to receive the value um, when to receive, when to be valued in the in the in the usual school assessment um, kind of process. So I, a thing that I'm thinking there is like this kind of outcome versus process oriented assessment and how to build that in so that it works also for the students um, and that they feel that they are getting there. The second big one and that was really the biggest is time. So this kind of project really this kind of learning has a completely different relationship with time. So just a couple of examples there that, um, um, sorry, now I have to put in the headphones because my house weight is coming. Hey. Sorry, um, so um, time in this kind of project is completely different to time in, in the school. So like one example there is that the students actually asked for more time. They said that they didn't, they felt they didn't have enough time to do their work. Um, and what Dimitri was doing that he was giving them as the project was continuing more and more like uh, more and more time just for themselves to organize themselves. And um, towards the end of the class, they had the entire lesson just for their own student less research. So that was really like time for process-based learning. That was their time. Uh, at the same time that they felt they didn't have enough time <laughs> or time space, as they call it, to really dig deeper. Um, Dimitri was saying to me um, that, um, wow, what a great, um, what a great uh, result, no? If you explain, and it's a quote from you. Uh, if I explained this to a head teacher of any school and told them that in nine lessons you would have an event like this, and he meant a poster event, that they would like the ideas. And that's the kind of, I think, performative time. So very often in schools, there's time for these kind of projects, but only in the performative. Yeah, we want a moment, an event where everybody's participating. But what the students liked and what was really important was these like, less performative moments, these moments of really thinking together and learning together, thinking critically. Um, and at the same time, um, 
the the school has this kind of controlling time um set up where it's like um who is in charge of which whose time is always um is always always a battle so uh, what i'm putting here like as a reflection for us is this kind of controlling performative time versus kind of more sustained time for care and process and then lastly the participation which obviously this kind of um work is participatory in itself and there's this really lovely way that um, students felt that doesn't matter who you are uh, and uh, you could whatever project you wanted to you could participate it you could participate in the project um, so it's a kind of learning because students can pick what they're interested in where they can participate in their own way and then maybe to jump uh, this kind of student-led research where students were peer um, interviewing each other and were kind of critical co-investigators that brought in student knowledge into the learning space. So within the learning space, different kinds of knowledges and interests participated in the kind of learning setup. Um, that then in the end uh, clashed with uh, other kind of um, things that the school had set up for them. And some of them, the student with uh, more special educational needs needed to leave the day of the poster conference because that didn't match. They, the school thought, oh, they will not understand this or they will not participate in this and they matched it. They had another event for them. So the kind of thinking about the diversity of who can uh, participate um, and in which aspect of the learning, I think, is another really important thing. If we want them to think critically and if we want them to reapply this kind of learning into, um, into their everydays. So that's like a really brief um, walking through some of these ideas. Thank you so much, Nelly.